Hello and welcome to another edition of What Does the Giraffe Say Media with me, Kathleen Rotorne. We're an organisation that aims to connect people in conservation by holding live interviews on social media. Today, I'm very happy to be joined by Ong Wong, and he is founder of Borneo and Sunbear uh, Conservation. And we're going to be discussing all things sunbears. So, Dr. Wong, if I could hand over to you, if you could tell us a little bit about yourself and what made you want to get into conservation. Yeah, sure. Okay. So, hi. Uh, my name is Yu Ti Wong. I am the founder and the chief executive officer of the Bonin Summit Conservation Center. I'm a wildlife biologist and a tropical forest ecologist. Um, and why I get at, why am I getting to conservation? I think for me, like most of the readers over here, you all are animal lovers since you were little, and so am I. So since little, I always have all kind of pets. I work with a lot of animals and I always want to become an animal expert when I was seven years old. And that does not change. Animal expert or a veterinarian. Okay. So after high school, I went to Taiwan to, uh, to, to further my study on veterinary as a diploma programs. And then when I was in Taiwan, I learned about bird watching. And that was a very, uh, important crossroad for me because through bird watching i got to learn about wildlife wild birds first and that's the very first connections and then after knowing more about um bird watching i realized that hey you know some things that is uh, pretty interesting in the wildlife world and then after i finished my program i worked with a wildlife professor become his research assistant. um working on various wildlife projects, including radio telemetry study of Munjak, uh, including doing fauna survey of, ser of several uh, 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 wildlife reserves. And then, uh, and that really, and also setting up a rescue center for protected endangered species in Taiwan. And then uh, that really get me into like, hey, you know, this is actually what I want. You know, at the times, you were talking about 30 years ago, all the vet classes are focusing on livestock mm -hmm. and unfortunately all of the animals in livestock industry end up dead and i really don't like it so 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 that opened up my horizon i feel like oh this is something that i want so i continue my my study into uh, studying wildlife biology in university of montana in, in the united states and then uh, during the first year, I met a professor who was looking for a Malaysian student to do a study on sun bears. And then uh, after a few years, I started my sun bear project in 1998. And there you go, working with wildlife and never ended until today. And talking about sun bears, I mean, it's not a topic that I was very uh, much aware of previously. Um, I actually became aware of it. Um, due to your work with the Remembering Wildlife book series and that kind of highlighted some of the stuff that you were doing. Um, so for those of those who are watching back home and they don't know anything about sun bears, can you talk to us a little bit about these animals? For example, why are they called sun bears? What kind of dynamics they live in and that kind of thing? Yeah, sure. Okay, so sun bears is the smallest of all the eight living bear species. And then they are found only in Southeast Asia, ranging from eastern tip of India, eastern tip of Bangladesh, southern tip of China, Myanmar, uh, 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 Thailand, Cambodia, Laos, Vietnam, Peninsula of Malaysia, Sumatra, and Borneo. And then uh, they are a true tropical bears that do not hibernate because in these regions, the weather is always relatively warm and there's no season for seasonality. And then uh, they are extremely arboreal. They are in black in color, have very, very short and sleek uh, hairs. And then uh, they have tiny little ear, really, really tiny little ear and have really, really long tongue, like 30 centimeters, you know. So for, and then they also, like this picture show you, they have like big claws. So they are actually quite uh, adaptable to like climbing and those, uh, and, and those uh, uh, claws is a tool. And why they are called sun bears is because some 200 years ago, there are actually two theories behind why they are called sun bears. One is some 200 years ago, uh, the biologists 
uh, who discover sun bear found sun bears in Malay Peninsula okay and at the times here in this part of the world you know the sun is really really strong and hot and then the bears was like basking under the sun and therefore they are called oh sun bear yeah mm. and then uh, and and another saying is that all of our the, the sun bear have a chest mark have a golden chest march on their chest and we call chest patch and then these chest patch come in all different kind of shapes including the shapes of a solar eclipse yeah like this picture show you know and uh and 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 interestingly the asiatic black bears also known as moon bear moon bear have this crescent shaped chest patch on their on their chest and i'm sure you know if there's a sun there must be a moon or if there's a moon there must be a sun to match the moon and the sun uh thing so at the end sun bears was known as Hila Actus Malayanus as the Latin or scientific name. Hila means sun, Actus means bear. Malayanus is where they are found on Malay Peninsula some 200, some 200 years ago. Okay, did I miss any questions? Um, <laughs> no, uh, what kind of dynamics do they live in? Are they social animals? Are they um, individual? How does it work there? Yeah, okay, so, so for sun bears, they are solitary animals. Uh, in the wild, the only times where anybody see two sun bears travel together are usually a mother with their cubs, or uh, a female as uh, or a female in estrus followed by a male, and uh, they are solitary animals. Uh, the reason is because they live in the forest where the food resources is extremely low you know and therefore they have this very very uh strong uh competitions among other bears they literally live in the bear kills bears world mm -hmm. yeah and then why are they so important to you uh, and to the ecosystems and what sort of threats are they facing as well okay so you know from years of study i started my study on sun bears some 24 years ago and where we are still uh, ongoing and conducting research and trying to understand about the roles that they play in the forest ecosystems. And then uh, one thing for sure, all of the roles that they play in the forest ecosystem have something to do with the food that they are eating. Say, for example, sun bears is an omnivore. They eat a wide variety of uh, wild fruits in the forest. And you get to understand that in this part of the world, the, the forest is extremely, extremely rich with biodiversity. Yeah, say for example, in Borneo Islands, there are more than 3,000 species of trees, and most of them bear fruits. Yeah, and then uh, for sun bears, they are omnivores, they eat fruits when fruits is available, and then when they eat fruits, they ingest the seed. Like the pictures of here showing the sun bears is feeding on durian. You know, there are several species of wild durian. If you know what durian's fruits is, durian's is fruits is the king of the fruits in this part of the world. Everybody either love it or hates it. Right? Yeah. <laughs> they are very strong smell, but the sun bear definitely love it. Yeah. And then uh, when they eat durian, they actually swallow the seed. The wild durian have relatively small seeds and also many seeds. So the sun bear swallow the seeds, the seed will pass through their digestive tracts and a few hours later come out in their pool. And at the same time, of course, this bear will, uh, will be like traveling around the forest. And that process is called seed dispersal. And seed dispersal is a very important process because the further away the sun bears, uh, the further away the seed being dispersed from the mother tree, the higher the chances of survival. So sun bears do the part sun bear is a forest planter and the second uh roles that they play is their forest so-called forest doctor when fruits is not available then the sun bears will feed on a wide variety of invertebrates including termite ants yeah and then uh so when they feed on termites some termite species like this group of termite called micro termites are known to attack live tree so when sun bear feeding on this termite uh, it actually controlled the, 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 the termite colony or termite populations to prevent termite, the termite from killing many trees at one time. So it makes sure the forest is healthy, make sure that everything in an equilibrium. The keyword here is equilibrium. 
yeah. balance in the yeah. forest ecosystems. And the third uh, role that they play is, uh, is forest engineer. Uh, besides termite, sun bear is also known as, uh, also love to eat honey. The local Malay name for the sun bears is Beruang Madu, is the honey bears. Why they are called Beruang Madu is because they really love to eat honey. And one kind of honey that they get hold of is this is this is the bee is the bee is honey from this bee called stingless bee. Stingless bee is stingless. Yeah. Or the, or the genus name is Trigona. And then uh, they build their hive inside a hollow tree trunk, usually from a hardwood species. So for sun bears, uh, they love honey so much, uh, just like you know, we need a pool. And then uh, whenever times when they find a beehive, a stingless beehive, they would climb the tree and then use their very strong claws and strong jaw to rip apart the uh, the, the tree cavity and expose the, the beehive and get hold of the honey. And that story does not end there. That story continue a few years later. That particular tree cavities that the sun bear duck will be used by say animals like hornbills as nests will be used by flying squirrels as nests or other tree cavity nests as nests therefore they are known as forest engineer okay and then uh the this is number uh, third the fourth uh roles that they place in the forest ecosystems is their forest farmer and and one of the very important food source in the forest is uh, earthworms. So earthworms, they have to do a lot of diggings or sometimes the cicada lava that boring inside to dip to the earth. So the sun bear would use their very sharp and strong claws to do a lot of digging. And that process is actually plowing the soil, loosen the soil, enhance the soil nutrient cycle. It's like farmers plowing or tilted the land before they start to, you know, grow their crops. Very important forest, uh, very important roles that they play over here. And then uh, lately, we also found out that sun bears are a very important food provider. And when they do the digging, when they do the digging on soil or feeding on decay wood, uh, they are messy feeder. They always left something behind. And in the forest, we have ev strong evidence that bearded pigs, uh, pheasants, uh, bunyan ground cuckoo, and other birds actually tag along sun bears for this feeding opportunity. And then uh, in return, these animals would alarm the bears if there is any danger around that area. So it's a mutualism uh, relationship between the bears and other animals. It's really amazing. And uh, so, so yeah, so I'm sure there is other roles, but so far, these five important roles is enough for us to say that, hey, you know, sun bears are such an important species in our forest ecosystems where it is extremely diverse. And then the presence of sun bear would benefit not only animals, but also plant species as well. So we need sun bears in our forest. We and do. Then, uh, indeed. Yes, yes. And then uh, the second part of the question is their yeah, threats. Okay, so um, South Asia is extremely rich in biodiversity. If you have been to our kind of forest, you see these pictures, all of these big giant trees, average canopy height is 50 meters tall. And there are trees that we call emergent species that grow up to like 70 meters. The tallest tropical tree in the world is here in Borneo, measure 100.8 meters tall. All of these giant trees are all hardwood. And hardwood in the human's eye are all valuable commodity. Okay, so 60, some 60, 70 years ago, logging stuck in this part of the world. Lots of the forests have been first logged uh, selectively, and then after that, convert into, uh, and after that, clear cut, and then convert into agriculture then. And then uh, because sun bears is a forest dependent species there and they live in the forest and no, uh, not other kind of uh, uh, landscape. So when this forest being cleared, they lost their habitat. So sun bear is suffering uh, a lot from this large scale deforestations or habitat loss. So this is uh, threats number one. 
And often after logging coming in, people coming into the forest interior and that follow the other second threat, which is hunting for their uh, hunting or poaching. Actually, sun bears is a protected species. So hunting for sun bear or poaching for sun bear for their meat. Obviously, this is a large mammal. And then in this part of world, developing country, Asian eat everything with four legs except table and chairs. You know, we joke about this. The Asians or the Chinese eat everything that can fly except an aeroplane, okay? So for sun bears, yeah, they are being consumed. They are being eaten. And then bear paws used to be served as an emperor dish in the ancient, I don't know what dynasty it is, some 2,000 years ago. So hunting is still a very, very uh, big threat for the sun bears. And not only meat, the other body parts like gallbladder has been used as a traditional Asian medicine for a long, long time. And then uh, on top of that, sun bear claws, sun bear canines, they all have their local use as, uh, as uh, um, you know, some, some local tribal people believe that these claws, canine, have possessed uh, supernatural power to drive away evil spirit and that kind of thing and because of that some they are being killed and then uh, and then the third threat of course is their babies are extremely extremely cute sun bear cubs when hunters poachers going hunting poaching when they come across a female bears with cubs they will not hesitate to kill the female and then take the cub and the cub are very cute when they are small they can be sell for money yeah and then uh, some of them will be kept as their personal house pets and imagine that this is the smallest bear species in the world although they are small and cute when they are little but it will grow into it won't it won't grow into a chihuahua you know i have to tell them that although they're hand fed the bottle fat since little they are not going to grow into a chihuahua they'll grow into a ferocious wild bears that can destroy everything in their home uh, so all of that has caused uh sun bears in this part of the world become endangered you know become locally extinct uh regionally extinct uh hopefully not species extinction yeah we got a question coming through from um, Jason Staples. Hey, Jason, nice to see you. Um, and he's asking, are sun bears bred for in Asia for their biome? Okay, so so bear. Okay, so obviously Jason knows about the importance of bear bile in in traditional uh, Asian medicine. It's not just a traditional Chinese medicine. It should be an Asian medicine because a lot of uh, ethnic city in Asia use bear bile. And then some, what, 20, 30 years ago, China start to farm the bears, put the, keep the bears alive, and then put them in small cages, and then milk the bow on a regular basis. And, and all of these bears have to be like put in a small, small cage, you know, to a point where they cannot even turn around. Yeah. And then those bears are being uh, inserted with a tube uh, surgically, and then milk the bowel on a regular basis. Okay, so this practice, usually the bears that involve are Asiatic black bears or the moon bear because most of the regions where this practice is happening in China or in Vietnam, the, 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 the bear species, uh, the majority of the bear species there are Asiatic black bears. So the, the main bear species involving in this bear farming are Asiatic black bears. However, the farm would not turn down any bears that come to them, including sun bears as well. So there's a small numbers or small proportions of sun bear being used uh, for bear farming in uh, in uh, in um, in Vietnam. You know the reason why we know is because uh, Animal Asia Foundations have rescued actually three species of bears, including brown bears including sun bears and also a majority of the bears are Asiatic black bear for the bear farming. So yes, they are, but the numbers of sun bears being used in bear, in the bear farming uh, are, uh, are, are sun bears, small number, majority are Asiatic black bear. And then uh, this practice only happened in China, 
Vietnam and a small portion in Laos and not in Malaysia. In Malaysia, we don't have uh, we don't have uh, uh, bear bear farm. People use bear bow. They just kill the bear, slaughter the bears, and use the bear bow. Yeah. yeah. Um, and then on another question, we have another question coming through from Stacy. Hey, Stacy, as always, lovely to see you. And she's asking, why are some of the markings on each of the bears' chests so different? Okay, so this is something that we observe you know their chest marking is like our fingerprints there's no two bears have the same kind of chest patch and i think uh, i don't know why they are different you know it's just the creator i need to ask whoever up there why they are different or you know the, the same question the same answer would be why our fingerprints are, are different and then uh, but what i can tell you is that uh, interestingly, uh, few, uh, lately we did a study and then found out that uh, their dots on each patch will getting bigger and bigger. The black dots is getting bigger and bigger when they get older. Okay. okay. And then I also have a theory of why is this chest patch important because they are black color. They live in a tropical forest where it is relatively dense it is not easy to see a sun bears in the forest. However, when they send something strain or then when they send something wrong or some strain things uh, 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 close to them, they would stand up by paddly, raise their head really high and sniff the air really strong. At the same time, presented their chest patch immediately the presence of the bears are being noticed. So it is like a warning sign to the other party saying that, hey, I'm here, don't mess around with me. Yeah, I think that serves this kind of purpose. In animal kingdom, there's a lot of animals when they got threatened or when they want to defend themselves, they flush, you know, yeah. and then make themselves very obvious in order to avoid any kind of physical confrontation. If they can size up hey i'm bigger than you you don't match me. you better leave you know yeah that kind of message and we've had some questions coming through from um from leslie and it also kind of fields into another question that jason had asked as well um but she's asking do you think that they're um well jason was asking what education you're doing in terms of teaching communities that there is no benefit to anything the sun bear provides and kind of she's following it into that by saying do you think beliefs about traditional Chinese medicine are changing with younger generations? Yeah, okay. So in terms of education, the Buddhist Sambet Conservation Center, where I founded some uh, 14 years ago, one of our one of the one of our pillars are working with education and trying to change the perceptions of local people, educate the local people about how what a sunbed is. Uh, how endangered they are, and also their their conservation status. They are all protected species. No one is allowed to keep to kill them, to eat them, to keep them as pets. So this kind of message, and then at the same time, trying to convince them not to use bear bar because it's a it's against the law. Trying to advise them if they are sick, go to hospital, go to see doctor, and don't go and kill a sun bears and then then you might lose the opportunity to see a real doctor that can cure your illnesses you know and uh, so this is extremely important that we do and the good thing is that we uh, have a center where we can welcome visitors to see the bears for their own uh, by with their own eyes we can tell the stories of them the sun bears and the rainforest and then especially the children, the kids, the school groups that come here, educate them. I think I think we did a good job, uh, although we can do better. And then uh, the last two years has been very challenging after this pandemic, our center was closed to the public. Uh, and right now, you know, group congregations are not encouraged. Uh, we'll see how it goes from now, well, from, from there. And right now, you know, all this, uh, uh, standard operating procedures to curb the pandemic is slowly ease up. The border of Malaysia will be opened soon on uh, on April first. Uh, so we are, yeah, um, working on that. And then uh, and the second question is about the TCM. Did I answer that? 
Yeah, yeah. Basically, we're just covering if you think that the attitudes have changed. I mean, have you yes, seen yes. that when you're talking with people that the younger generation aren't? Yeah, the younger generation definitely changing, you know, because, you know, compared to in the past, because here you got to understand that this is a third world country, yeah, developing country compared to where you are, you are, you know, developed country. And then, uh, but over the years, uh, lots of, uh, of uh, infrastructures, uh, especially medical care, health care, have greatly improved. There are clinics, there are medical centers that in their village, you know, although some of them are very remote, yet government have had this uh, government health clinic or government hospitals in the area where they live. So, so it's still important to tell them that if you are sick, go to see a doctor and don't go to queue or try to queue a virus and 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 eat, uh, eat the uh, medicines. Yeah, eat, eat the gallbladder as a traditional medicine. That kind of message is extremely important, and we are seeing things uh, yeah improving. And especially, we also trying to um, uh, try to what try to uh, work with the garments, especially the law enforcement agency. If we see anybody possess a bare gallbladder, that is a big offense. So we need to stop that kind of behavior as much as possible. Does the government take it seriously? I mean, what uh, you mentioned earlier about them being kept as pets, is that illegal? And then also with the, the trade itself in the in the body parts, uh, if does the government follow through when they people are are, are caught? Yeah, absolutely. You know, okay. So first of all, the, say for example, I'm in Sabah. Okay, the Sabah stage, the law that protects Sunday for the very first time was passed in 1997. I came here to conduct my Sunday study in 1998. So literally a year before, there's no law. You can keep whatever you want. Yeah. You know. So so that's why people. You know, there was one time where we were went to we went to a, a, a small village to confiscate the bear and then the villagers argue with us argue with the law enforcement agency saying that hey my grandfather used to have two bears my father used to have one bear why can't i keep a bear i said no because there's a law just passed back in 1997 you know if you claim that whatever your great great grandfather do or your grandfather do and your father do you also can do it right now try head hunting and see what happened they are murud you know, they their 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 culture, their tradition used to have like head hunting. Yeah. Sorry, it's not allowed anymore. <laughs> yeah. So so they need to understand that they need to know about this. So a lot of time it's just you know giving these informations uh to 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 show them that uh no, this is something that they cannot do. And then in terms of the government's enforcement agency, you know, because of this laws is relatively new. And then, uh, so during the law enforcement, uh, you know, sometimes it's relatively weak, okay? And there's a lot of rooms to, uh, to, to, to improve. And then uh, good laws is not enough. You still need to follow with good law enforcement. And then after the enforcement means that you go and catch those people who possess illegal stuff like a sunbag, gallbladder, or claw. And then after that, you have to prosecute them in court and then if they are successfully being prosecuted and the judge have to you know give them a strong penalty yeah so that you'll create a deterrence for other people not to do the same thing again yeah, yeah. and we've got a question coming through from um uh, claudia eva and they're saying what made people think that bear parts or any animal parts would be beneficial for healing and is it also about making money Oh, definitely it's going to uh, it's involving making money as well you know and then because again this part of the world uh one of the challenge for us as a conservation is deal with it's, it's all about people's problem okay and right now we are facing with a problem of the gaps between the rich and the poor is getting bigger and bigger and bigger the rich are so rich and they are willing to pay a lots of money for a sunbag gallbladder, for pangolin meat, for, you know, bear paws or tiger bones and this kind of thing. And the poor are so poor where even they know that their acts of killing this wildlife is illegal, but yet they still need to take the risk. That is a so big, huge social problems that we face in this part of the world. And then, uh, and then what makes them uh, think that the bear parts uh, would benefit would be beneficial for healing is because 
their great great grandfather do uh, say so because their grandfather say so because their father say so this is traditions yeah and also those people who have been using the gallbladder say for example as a traditional medicine say it works you know our body have the ability to self-heal even if i'm sure even if they don't take the gallbladder they would rest enough if one of the one of the the illnesses that the gallbladder are commonly used for is to treat internal injuries say for example if they fall from a tree or something like that if they have a, a suffer from an injuries yeah and our body have a self heal but you know those people after they eat this gallbladder say oh they heal after a week or so and oh it must be the gallbladder yeah. so that is that kind of mentality that make these things and this 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 gallbladder thing become so popular and then of course you know people would tends to exaggerate it yeah. when a story passed to one person to another person uh to a point that it well it really works <laughs> yeah and and right now i'm seeing right now as we speak the porcupine buzzword is going to be another oh you know i don't know who created who said that the porcupine buzzword would heal aids would cure uh covid patient you know yeah. all these things is like oh if you yeah. are sick go to see doctor come on yeah, yeah. <laughs> i completely agree with you i mean you touched on it a little bit earlier when we were talking about your center and education um now you do have this rehabilitation site how do the bears typically come to you how do you find out about them and then do they stay there forever or do they get released what's the situation there yeah okay so when we when our message you know our we do education when our message getting further and further out there more and more people knows that hey keeping a sun bear is illegal keeping a sun bear is not cool you know keeping a sun bear should be reported to the authority so there are right now there are more and more eyes out there to help us to look for anybody who have a sun bear as cubs or sun bear as pets and things like that so when they saw uh, anybody have a bear in their possessions or in their homes they would report either to us or the sabah wildlife department the local authority on wildlife and then uh, the wildlife department would go and confiscate and rescue the bears and after that the bears are going to be uh, will be sent to us to take care of so depending on the conditions whether this is a bear cub a tiny little baby uh, just being captured not too long ago after the after the poacher killed the mother or a bear that was kept as a pet for several years in their home okay and then uh, for those adult bears that we rescue you know we think uh, we believe their chances of rehabilitating and release back into the wild will be very very low so we don't uh, think about release those bears because they bear has been habituated they associate human with food they lost the instinct of uh, finding food in the wild and and also climbing trees you know they don't have the muscle uh, to climb trees they grow up in small cages so 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 those bear are going to be kept at our center uh for uh welfare purposes animal welfare purposes we keep them we take good care of them we use them as the ambassador of the species or an education uh a subject to educate the public about hey how cool is the sun bear you can see the sun bear you can film the sun bear you can photograph the sun bear or something like that and then for those cubs that we rescue they have a higher chances of uh being released back into the wild so the first thing that we do is trying to bond with them because all of this infant mammal when they are captured from the wild i mean separated from their mother they are traumatized yeah. you know they are completely traumatized it's so sad to see that how can a humans do a, such a thing to a infant mammal it's just like you know imagine that it's, it's your own baby being you know kidnapped you know and then uh, so the first thing is trying to bond with them once the bonding established means that the bear cub would trust us and then they treat us as the surrogate mother and then they come down their stress level go down they fed that they, they will they will feed more they will grow fast and then once the bonding established we will bring them into the forest uh, we walk them in the forest so that they got the connections to the forest since little and then their instinct usually are very strong where they whenever they see a decay wood they know oh you know there are potential food items they will scratch cut up ah, bingo 
there are termites out in there. In our rainforest, there are so many invertebrates, okay? The woody debris usually are infested with ants, termites, and other invertebrates, or wood boring invertebrates, or beetle larvae, and things like that. So their instinct will kick in, they will use their very sharp and long claws and look for it. So it's very important for, for them to have a connection with the forest where their instinct is still remains strong. And then when they get bigger and bigger, bigger and bigger, and then when they reach adulthood, they, and we, of course, we assess their ability, uh, whether they are a good release candidate or not. And then if they are, then we are planning for the release. So far, out of the 66 sun bears that we rescued over the last 14 years, uh, 11 has been released back into the wild. Just last month, we released Wawa back in the forest, and right now we are monitoring uh, her movements. Uh, so far, so good. I would say, finger crossed that she's going to make it, yeah. And then how do you make sure that then they're not kind of habituated to humans? Because obviously if they've been, you've imprinted on them and then they're going in the wild, um, yeah. I mean, they're, they're a bear, I'm assuming that they can be aggressive if they come against a human. How does that work? Yeah, so that is a very good question. This is our weakness, okay? This is something that is so difficult to do because obviously we have to like, you know, infant when they come in, we have to nurse them, we have to bottle feed them. So, but we see is that we try to minimize the people that have contact with the with the with the cubs. So for our center, we have designated a few staff that are taking care of the bear, and involving in this kind of uh, bear cubs rehabilitation process, and not any keepers. And then we minimize the human contact of this bear towards any strangers. Yeah, and then we also see that when this bear is getting bigger and bigger, their awareness around the the, the awareness. Are on their surrounding also increase as well and they tend to shy away from stranger okay but yet they are seeing people so in order to increase the successful of the rehabilitations when we release them back in the forest we tend to choose to choose to release them in a big forest reserve with no humans anywhere close so in the past, we have several incidents where we have to charter a helicopter to bring them right in the middle of the forest. Uh, say, for example, Tabin Wildlife Reserve is double the size of Singapore with not a single human live in there. In Sabah, we still have this kind of big forest. So the, the bears are being hard released right in the middle and then uh, they have to roam. You know, So far, none of the bears that we release in the in the middle of the bears have come out from the forest and then also uh this big forest reserve we drop them right in the middle uh, the chances of them getting out is less and also people getting into them is also less so this is the best that we can do you know and 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 unfortunately i cannot guarantee that they'll live happily ever after after i open the door you know, they are subjected to all the threats that a wild bear may face in the forest. Yeah, so... You're just trying to make the best out of a bad situation, I guess. Yes, absolutely. And then, therefore, you know, for me, I'm a wildlife biologist. I don't want to see bears in captivity, not even at my center. Yeah. You know, therefore, we have to spend a lot of efforts to educate the local people not to keep bear, not to kill bear, not to have wild bears being removed from the wild and then bring in captivity so we have to stop that part we have to stop the change from you know from coming in as much as we can yeah and if people are watching back home and they want to support the work that you're doing and, and help i mean i know the borders are opening up now so hopefully that will allow you to have um more people coming and seeing um, what's the best way for people to support the project okay so i think the the best way is to visit our website okay in our website obviously our works needs money needs fund to make all of this possible so you can visit our website and then uh, from our website you can do many things you can say for example you can uh, donate make a direct donations on our website you know you click the donate uh, uh, button and then it brings you to a, either you do a money donation and you can also shops at our shops you know and uh, so when you buy our merchandise you also help us as well and you can also uh, 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 you know uh, visit our social media. I think awareness is extremely important. Help us spread the word. We have social media like Facebook, which is very active. We got Instagram, we got Twitters, 
and then uh, and then on from our website you can also adopt our bears as well you know so this bear adoption program are, are, are very popular and you can help us and if you have additional time and effort you can be our volunteers and then uh, lastly i always tell people do what you do best to help but think about what you do best there is always a room for you to fit in the gap and help us if you are a writer hey write about our story write about sun bears if you're a student study sun bears you know if you got extra money donate to us if you are a, a filmmaker see for example uh, yeah so if, if you are a broadcaster like today you are helping us to spread the word you know so there is always room for anybody to help us in so many ways sun bear is the least known bear in the world and there are so many things that we need to do. Yes. I completely agree. And if you are watching this back home, please do give it a like, comment, and share. The more people that see this, the more awareness we can raise for these sun bears and the work that is being done to protect them. Um, okay, so I've only got one more question left, and then we'll start to wrap up. If you're watching back home and you would like to put a question to Dr. Wong, then please do so. Just pop it in the comments section, and I'll be able to do just that for you. Um, and thank you. As we've been talking, we've had lots of lovely comments and a lot of support. So really appreciate all of that. Um, so I was wondering what it was that, um, that you're planning for the future and what your favorite success story is. Mm, OK, that's a very good question. I think uh, this pandemic hit us really hard. All right. Over the last two years, we have been close to the public. And then uh, and I think my near future plan is to have to rebuild the center not rebuilding physically but to make sure that the center is ongoing and running uh in terms of doing uh in terms of financially doing well so that we can continue our work uh continue feeding our bears and then at the same time uh we are planning the next stage which is the implementations of the Sava sun bear action plan uh, over the last two years or three years or so we have been developing this action plan and then uh, and then there's a series of work research work conservation work uh wildlife poaching work education works all in that action plan and we need to implement it, that action plan uh, yeah and so that you know sun, sun bears can be conserved uh um in sabah or the rest of southeast asia for a long long time yeah so and, and your, favorite, your favorite your uh favorite -huh. success story uh, my favorite success story, I think, you know, setting up the Bunin Sambe Conservation Center, uh, I think I'm very, very proud and very, very happy and very, very thankful that I managed to set up the center in the first place some 14 years ago and run the center with the help from my so many staff, so many volunteers and so many people across the world who have been supporting our works um and uh, i think and right now the Bodin summit conservation center has become a model for conservation where me as a biologist working closely with government agency working closely with various stakeholders ngos to make our work possible uh so thank you so much for supporting our works and i hope you all can continue to support our work we are not done yet in terms of to conserve sun bear we are still facing a huge dilemma of trying to save species and in the near future you know uh, species extinction is a huge crisis that coming to us you know bigger than covid bigger than the wars between ukraine and russia um and of course you know climate change is another thing you know species extinction is huge it's big so we have to get ourselves ready and trying to stop or slow down species extinction as much as possible so for me since i have been working with sunbears over the last you know 20 more than 20 years and i will continue to do it until i what retire maybe <laughs> <laughs> and we have a question coming through from jason and he's asking are you able to take a census of the sunbears or oh, it's virtually impossible you know sun bears are a elusive species and they live in this very dense tropical rainforest or tropical forest and it's extremely extremely difficult to see them to sense to count individual 
So over the last few years, the most effective way of uh, uh, detecting bad presence is setting up camera traps in the study. Uh, it extremely it is extremely costly. Okay, and sun bears does not like a leopard or a tiger where they have this unique stripe. You know, when you when they uh, when their pictures being taken by this camera trap, they can identify individual. For so for the sun bear, it's a little bit tricky because we need to photograph the chest patch. Yeah. yeah, so the setting up the camera will be a lot more compared to just you know yeah. one camera. So 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 yeah, so we are still working on that, but it's not easy. And then in West Malaysia, the local authority have come up, have come up with a number saying that there's only like uh, three hundred to five hundred sun bear left in West Malaysia. Uh, that is the only places where I see there are you know local authority estimates uh, how many sun bears are there in that particular regions, but not in Sabah or not in other parts of Southeast Asia. But the numbers are very low. That's for sure. Mm -hmm. Okay, well, thank you so much for coming on the show. We've had such lovely comments as we've been talking. So thank you, everyone, back home for the kind words and support. Um, before we say goodbye, is there anything that you'd like to say? Uh, well, do what you do best to help sun bears, you know. And hopefully when the borders is reopened again, when the world is safe to travel again, I invite you to come and visit us and see the sun bear with your own eye and experience the rainforest and got bitten by bird sucking leeches. You know. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you're doing a good sales job till the end. Um, but yes, I completely agree. Um, please do like, comment, share, all of this kind of things all help to provide awareness and we really appreciate every little effort nothing is too small um so thank you again dr wong for coming on the show um and thank you everyone for joining and enjoy the rest of your day yeah thank you very much kathleen for this opportunity this week thank no you problems.